page one. <clears throat> Oh, pussycat, I'm so glad to hear your voice, the girl's mother said on the telephone. My body is betraying me again. Sometimes I think my life is nothing but one long process of bodily betrayal. Isn't that everybody's life, the girl, Pip, said. She'd taken to calling her mother midway through her lunch break at Renewable Solutions. It brought her some relief from the feeling that she wasn't suited for her job, that she had a job that nobody could be suited for, or that she was a person unsuited for any kind of job. And then after 20 minutes, she could honestly say that she needed to get back to work. My left eyelid is drooping, her mother explained. It's like there's a weight on it that's pulling it down, like a tiny fisherman sinker or something. Right now, off and on, I'm, I'm wondering if it might be Bell's palsy. Whatever Bell's palsy is, I'm sure you don't have it. If you don't even know what it is, pussycat, how can you be so sure? I don't know, because you didn't have Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism, melanoma? It wasn't as if Pip felt good about making fun of her mother. But their dealings were all tainted by moral hazard a useful phrase she'd learned in college economics. She was like a bank too big in her mother's economy to fail, an employee too indispensable to be fired for bad attitude. Some of her friends in Oakland also had problematic parents, but they still managed to speak to them daily without undue weirdnesses transpiring because even the most problematic of them had resources that consisted of more than just their single offspring. Pip was it, as far as her own mother was concerned. Well, I don't think I can go to work today, her mother said. My endeavor is the only thing that makes that job survivable, and I can't connect with the endeavor when there's an invisible fisherman sinker pulling on my eyelid. Mom, you can't call in sick again. It's not even July. What if you get the actual flu or something? And meanwhile, everybody's wondering what this old woman with half her face drooping onto her shoulder is doing bagging their groceries. You have no idea how I envy you, your cubicle, the invisibility of it. Let's not romanticize the cubicle, Pip said. <laughs> this is the terrible thing about bodies. They're so visible, so visible. <clears throat> Pip's mother, though chronically depressed, and yes, here it is on the second page of the book, depressed. <laughs> Pip's mother, though chronically depressed, wasn't crazy. She'd managed to hold on to her checkout clerk job at the New Leaf Community Market in Felton for more than 10 years, and as soon as Pip relinquished her own way of thinking and submitted to her mother, she could track what she was saying perfectly well. The only decoration on the gray segments of her cubicle was a bumper sticker, at least the war on the environment is going well. Her colleagues' cubicles were covered with photos and clippings, but Pip herself understood the attraction of invisibility. Also, she expected to be fired any month now, so why settle in? Have you given any thought to how you want to not celebrate your not birthday? She asked her mother. Frankly, I'd like to stay in bed all day with the covers over my head. I don't need a not birthday to remind me that I'm getting older. My eyelid is doing a very good job of that already. Why don't I make you a cake and I'll come down and we can eat it? You sound sort of more depressed than usual. I'm not depressed when I see you. Ha, too bad I'm not available in pill form. Could you handle a cake made with stevia? I don't know, stevia does something funny to the chemistry of my mouth. There's no fooling a taste bud in my experience. Sugar has an aftertaste too, Pip said, although she knew that argument was futile. Sugar has a sour aftertaste that the taste bud has no problem with because it's built to report sourness without dwelling on it. The taste bud doesn't have to spend five hours registering strangeness, strangeness, which was what happened to me the one time I drank a stevia drink. But I'm saying the sourness does linger. There's something very wrong when a taste bud is still reporting strangeness five hours after you've had a sweetened drink. Do you know that if you smoke crystal meth even once, your entire brain chemistry is altered for the rest of your life? That's what stevia tastes like to me. <laughs> I'm not sitting here puffing on a meth stem, if that's what you're trying to say. I'm saying I don't need a cake, 
No, I'll find a different kind of cake. I'm sorry I suggested a kind that's poison to you. I didn't say it was poison. I, it's simply that Stevia does something funny to your mouth chemistry, yeah. Pussycat, I'll eat whatever kind of cake you bring me. Refined sugar won't kill me. I didn't mean to upset you, sweetheart, please. No phone call was complete before each had made the other wretched. The problem, as Pip saw it, the essence of the handicap she lived with, the presumable cause of her inability to be effective at anything, was that she loved her mother, pitied her, suffered with her, warmed to the sound of her voice, felt an unsettling kind of non-sexual attraction to her body, was solicitous even of her mouth chemistry, wished her greater happiness, hated upsetting her, found her dear. This was the massive block of granite at the center of her life, the source of all the anger and sarcasm that she directed not only at her mother, but more and more self-defeatingly of late, at less appropriate objects. When Pip got angry, it wasn't really at her mother, but at the granite block. So that's the beginning of the California section that begins the book. There's an East German section, which we will skip. I actually think it may be the best thing I ever wrote, that section that we're skipping, so I'm not, I'm not denigrating my own work. Um, the third section is, takes place substantially in Texas, Amarillo, uh, where uh, one of the other main characters, a journalist named Lila Helou, uh, Lebanese-American, has gone to investigate a missing nuclear weapon. <clears throat> she goes to a little town to talk to a woman named Felicia Babcock, who works at a drive-in burger place. Just a little bit of this. <clears throat> What Felicia told her while Lila sat on the floor amid ketchup smears and Mexican music was that Cody Flaner was an all-hat loser she'd counted the days till she could get away from. Between his fine ass and his soft eyes and his droopy little puppy eyelashes, she hadn't been able to resist getting in the sack with him, but she swore to Lila that she'd never meant for him to leave his wife and kids. He'd surprised her with that, and then for a while she was stuck with him. All she'd wanted was a good time, and here she'd wrecked people's lives. She felt bad about it, and so she lived with Cody for six whole months. You stayed with him because you felt guilty, Lila said. Kind of, that and free rent and lack of immediate other options. You know, I did the same thing when I was your age, wrecked a marriage. Maybe if it can be wrecked, it ought to be wrecked. There are different schools of thought on that. <laughs> so how long do you stick around, or did you not even feel guilty? That's the thing, Lila smiled. I'm still married to him. Well, that's a happy ending. Safe to say there's been some guilt along the way. You know, you seem okay to me. I never met a reporter before. You're not what I expected. That's because I'm freaking good at getting people to open up, Lila thought. Felicia interrupted herself to serve a carload of teenagers and then to scold her co-workers. Hey, fellas, no quiero la musica, menos laudo, por favor. <laughs> that Cody was the best thing that ever happened to Felicia was a conviction of his that she did not reciprocate. The more he tried to impress her, the less impressed she got. He picked a bar fight in her presence to show her how well he could take getting the crap beaten out of him. His wife, the baboon face, hadn't managed to get his wages garnished for child support, count on big government to screw things up. And he bought Felicia piles of bling and other stuff, including a brand new iPad, to impress her. The whole idea behind his July 4th surprise was to impress her. She knew that he worked at the bomb plant and had the most boring of all the jobs there. He could jaw for hours about variable yields and bunker busters and kilotonnage, making himself out to be personally responsible for keeping the nation safe. 
She finally got fed up and told him the truth, namely that he was a nobody and she wasn't impressed with these bombs that he didn't actually have anything to do with. She hurt his feelings, but she didn't care. She'd already exchanged meaningful eye contact with his friend Kyle, who lived over in Pampa. On the night of July 3rd, coming home late from drinking with her girlfriends, she found Cody waiting for her on the front steps. He said he had another present for her. He took her around to the backyard where something big and cylindrical was lying on a blanket. Cody said it was a fully armed B-61 thermonuclear warhead. <laughs> and what did she think of that? <laughs> well, she was afraid was what? Cody said, I want you to touch it. I want you to get buck naked and lay on it. And then I'm gonna do you like you never been done in your whole life. She hedged by saying she didn't want to get radiation poisoning. <laughs> Cody said the warhead was totally safe to handle and be around. He made her touch it with her hand and explained to her about one point safety and permission action links. It was the usual all hat routine, talking about stuff he didn't really understand and had nothing to do with, except that this time there was an actual thermonuclear warhead on a blanket in his yard. And I know how to set it off, he said. You do not, Felicia said. There's a way if you got the codes and I got the codes, I can wipe old Admirillo right off the map right now. Why would you do that, Felicia wanted to know. She half believed him and two thirds didn't. <laughs> to make you see how much I love you, Cody said. Felicia said she didn't see the connection between loving her and blowing up Amarillo. <laughs> she thought that conceivably by saying this, by buying time, she was saving tens of thousands of innocent Amarillo lives, her own not least among them. She was listening out of one ear for police sirens. Cody then assured her that he wasn't going to do it. He just wanted her to know that he could do it. He, Cody Flaner. He wanted her to feel the kind of power he had at his disposal. He wanted her to take off all her clothes and put her arms around the bomb and stick her little tail up in the air for him. Didn't the bomb's terrible, dangerous power make her want that? It did, actually, when he put it like that. She went ahead and did what he'd said, and they hadn't had such a good time since before he'd surprised her by moving out on his wife. To be that close to so much potential death and devastation, to have her sweaty skin against the cool skin of a death bomb, to imagine the whole city going up in a mushroom cloud when she orgasmed, it was pretty great, she had to say. <laughs> At the same time, it was obviously a one-night-only thing. Either Cody would be hauled off to jail, or he'd have to take the B-61 back to where it belonged. <laughs> and that would be the end of them having orgasmic sex with her face mashed up against the casing of a 300 kiloton death bomb. To enjoy it while it lasted, they went at it a second time. Cody got her all wound up, but afterwards she felt sad for him. He wasn't very bright, and she'd already made up her mind to go with Kyle. First person narrative. Lands about two thirds of the way through the book. Oh, there was something I wanted to say about this. <clears throat> it's set in the 90s, pre, pre cell phone. My affair with Annabelle had begun as soon as our divorce decree came through. In exchange for stipulating that I'd abandoned her, abandonment being one of the few grounds for divorce that New York state law recognized and the one that Annabelle felt best captured the wrong she'd suffered, I'd been permitted to reclaim our valuable rent-controlled tenement in East Harlem while Annabelle went off to live by herself in the woods of New Jersey. Since there could be no talk of inflicting Manhattan on her, 
I had to take the bus across 125th Street and the subway up to 168th, followed by a much longer and invariably nauseating bus ride over the Hudson and out through increasingly raw developments to the hills northwest of Netcong. I'd made this trip twice in February, twice in March, and once in April. On the last Saturday in May, my phone rang around 7 in the morning, not long after I'd gone to bed drunk. I answered it only to stop the ringing. Oh, Annabelle said, I thought I was going to get your machine. I'll hang up and you can leave a message, I said. No, this is only going to be 30 seconds. I swear I will not get drawn in again. Annabelle, I just wanted to say that I reject your version of us. I utterly reject it. That's my message. Couldn't you have rejected my version by just never calling me again? I'm not getting drawn in, she said, but I know the way you operate. You interpret silence as capitulation. You don't remember me promising I'd never interpret your silence that way the very last time we spoke. I'm hanging up now, she said, but at least be honest, Tom, and admit that your promise was a low trick, a way of having the last word. I laid the phone on my mattress next to my ear and mouth. Are we at the point yet where I get blamed for this conversation lasting more than 30 seconds, or do I still have that to look forward to? No, I'm hanging up, she said. I wanted to say, for the record, that you're completely wrong about us. But that's all. So, I'm going to hang up. Okay, then. Goodbye. But she could never hang up, and I could never bear to do it for her. I'm not blaming you, she said. You did consume my youth and then abandon me, but I know you're not responsible for my happiness out here. Although, in fact, I'm having a good time and things are going pretty well, unbelievable as it may sound to a person who considers me, quote, unequipped to deal with the, quote, real world. <laughs> Consumed my youth and then abandoned me, I quoted back. But this is not a provocation. You just wanted to leave a 30-second message which I would have done, but you reacted. I reacted, Annabelle, do I need to point this out? I reacted to your picking up a telephone and dialing my number. Right, I know, because I'm so needy, right? I'm so pathetically needy. I couldn't have named one instant of happiness or ease from our previous togetherness binge four weeks earlier. I emerged from these binges feeling bruised and harrowed with worrisome bomb craters in my memory, but also a vague, sick craving for a do-over. Look, I said, do you want to get together? Do you want me to come out? Is that why you called? No, I do not want to get together. I want to hang up the phone if you would please just let me. <laughs> Usually in the past, though, when you've called, I said, you've started out saying you didn't want to get together, and then after a couple of hours on the phone, it's come out that you did actually all along underneath want to get together. If you want to come out and see me, she said, you should have the decency to say so in so many words. And by then, of course, like any polite man who wants to spend time with a woman he respects, instead of making your invitation some sort of icky accusation, by then, of course, I said, it's gotten to be pretty late in the day, which means that by the time we actually do get together, which is what you've secretly wanted all along, it's very late, and when we then inevitably go ahead and sleep together, instead of insidiously twisting things around, she said, so that it looks like my neediness rather than yours, my lousy life rather than your own lousy life, inevitably go ahead and sleep together. I don't want to sleep with you. I don't want to see you. That's not why I called. I called to say a simple thing, which it's three or four in the morning before we actually get around to the sleeping part of sleeping together, which with three hours of travel and a work day ahead of me me, has tended in the past to become kind of a bad scene, is all I'm trying to remind you. If you want to come out and go for a hike with me, she said, that would be very nice. I would like that. But you have to say it's what you want. But I didn't call you, I said. But you were the one who brought up getting together, so just be honest with me now. Is this something you want? Not unless you want it and you say so like a human being. But that perfectly mirrors my own sentiments. So, look, I called, she said. You could at least, what could I do? 
Do you think I'm going to harm you if you let your defenses down for one tiny half second? I mean, what do you think I'm going to do? Make you my slave? Force you to be married to me again? It's a hike, for God's sake. It's just a hike. Simply to avoid the two-hour version of this conversation, <clears throat> wherein party A tried to prove that party B had made the fatal statement that prolonged the conversation in the first place, and party B challenged party A's version of events, and this in turn, there being no actual transcript, compelled party A to reconstruct from memory the conversation's overture, and party B to offer a reconstruction that differed from party A's in certain crucial respects, which then necessitated a time-devouring joint effort to collate and reconcile the two reconstructions, I agreed to go out to New Jersey and take a hike. <laughs> Thank you very much.